never fails. Somebody devises a product that is effective and useful or just beautiful but expensive, and somebody else will come up with a knockoff version of the real thing, right? It doesn't take long for someone to do it. A cheap imitation is marketable in our world because we are very much interested more in what it looks like or how it makes us look than in the real thing. Uh, we don't actually have to wear a Rolex if other people think it's a Rolex. We don't actually have to carry a Gucci bag as long as others think it, it's a Gucci bag. We, why spend $300 on a pair of sunglasses when a $10 knockoff pair will make you look just as cool as long as people think they're the real thing, the designer thing? In Houston, I think you can still make a trip down to the Harwin Market and find about anything you want in electronics or uh, fashion or perfume or whatever. It's almost the real thing. And if you're too lazy to go down there or too scared to, there are knockoff websites that are everywhere. They come and go. I guess they get shut down by uh, some kind of commerce laws, but back they show up again. And you can get your set of golf clubs or your clothes that look almost like the real thing, and probably nobody's going to know the difference except you. Why pay the full price when you can manage your image with an imitation? You can have people think that you are more than you are, or have more than you have, or that you're someone you're not, and it won't cost you all that much. Why pay the full price to keep your image going? Now, don't raise any ethical questions about piracy or a violation of people's uh, artistic rights by purchasing the other one, because you may not like the answers you come up with. We are a culture that thrives on substitutes, cheap imitations of the real thing, on an image that's ma managed rather than the connection with the real thing. We would much rather have the uh, easy answers to a difficult question so that we don't have to think too deeply. We'd like to have maybe uh, a sound bite instead of a lengthy, solid conversation about something. We'd rather have a bumper sticker express our theology or our political philosophy than to do the hard work of thinking through what things mean. Now, all of that may work pretty well with sunglasses and golf clubs and perfumes and handbags, but when it comes to God, accepting a substitute just doesn't work. Generic substitutes for God are something entirely different. Chris read the story a few moments ago of Israel's encounter in the wilderness with a moment when they weren't sure about themselves. Moses had gone up on the mountain and had been there for 40 days, and it was a pretty scary-looking mountain, if you ask me. Fire and earthquakes and smoke. I mean, who knows what might have happened up on the mountain. And he hasn't come back. They haven't got a word from him, not a text, not an email, nothing for 40 days. Who knows if he's ever coming back? What if we're just stranded out here and now our leader is gone? And he's the one that seemed to have some contact with God and what God wanted. And if Moses is gone, we may just be stuck. So they go to his brother Aaron, second in command, sort of, the priest of the crew, and said, we want you to make a God for us who will go before us. Because this man, Moses, we, we don't know what's become of him. He could have been devoured by the mountain, slain by God, eaten by a bear. We don't know. We want a God that goes before us. Now, up until this point, they had had a God who went before them. Pillar of smoke by day, pillar of fire by night. The problem with that God was that you never knew exactly when the smoke was going to appear and move or when the fire was going to move. You could be comfortable for days on end, and suddenly the word gets out in the camp, God's on the move, we have to go, and you have to pack up and go. You could have been traveling for just half a day, and, and the column stops. And all that work of getting ready to go out, and now you have to stop and set up camp again. And we could be leaving the next day or three days from now or a week. From, it was inconvenient to have a God like that go before them. They wanted one they could have a little more control over. So they asked Aaron to make them a God. So he takes an offering up, takes the gold that he receives from folks, fashions it into a golden calf, sets it before the people of Israel and says, Here is your God, O Israel. 
that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And then he proclaimed a fast day, a feast day to the Lord. And if you look in your Bible, when it says the Lord there around in verse uh, 12, the word, or this is verse 5, the word Lord is in all capital letters. That always translates the name of God, Yahweh, Jehovah. We're proclaiming a feast day to Yahweh, the God Moses met at the bush, the one who has brought us out of Egypt, but now represented by this golden calf that's in front of us, a knockoff, a cheap substitute, an idol. Well, meanwhile, back up on the mountain, God says to Moses, uh, you're going to need to go back down to the valley because your people, whom you brought out of Egypt, have fashioned an idol and have proclaimed a feast day to me, and you need to go take care of that because I think I'm going to destroy them. And Moses intercedes and says, Lord, your people whom you brought out of Egypt, let's, uh, nobody really wants responsibility for them when they're behaving like this. But he goes back, prays for them, and then goes back down. And you know the story. You've seen the movie. How he takes the, the Ten Commandments that the Lord had given him, and he crashes them. It would be like tearing up a contract. It was saying... You violated the covenant. We had this agreement with God, and you've already violated it. They had violated at least two commandments at this point. The first commandment was, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You shall have no other gods before me. Uh, priority is given to God in the first commandment. But the second commandment is slightly different. It has a, a different sort of spin to it. It is, you shall not make unto me any graven, carved images of anything that exists in creation. Do not ever confuse me with the creation. I am the creator. Slightly different things. And Israel has taken this path now of forming an idol, an image, and saying this is our God. Um, morality was taking a slide that looked like a bad Friday on Wall Street. They were just dipping deep into their disobedience. Now, in some ways... In some ways, that kind of behavior is understandable in the wilderness. The wilderness is often a place where we feel stranded, where we don't know what's happening next. We feel out of control. And we may go for a long period of time without having a clear sense of what's next. It's easy to panic in the wilderness. We can demand instant gratification. We want what we want now. We just want the pain to stop, or we just want an answer to our question. And in our fear and anxiety in the journey between Egypt and Canaan, we can find ourselves insisting on a God who will do what we want, who will make the pain go away, who will end the confusion, who will take away our discomfort. We suddenly want a very different kind of God than the God we've been attempting to deal with. We'll settle for a substitute. What we really want in the wilderness is not God, but a remedy. We want things fixed. We just want it to stop. And that's not the way it works. That kind of demand is deadly. It certainly was for ancient Israel. It began when they were willingly substituting a knockoff God, a substitute God, for the real thing. They violated the second commandment. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above, or on earth beneath, or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. How does the second commandment differ from the first? Why do we need two of them? If there are only ten, you think God would be pretty um, conservative in offering. You don't want two that overlap, right? We only have so much space on the tablets. And so here, the first commandment is the one that insists that God be God in our life, that Yahweh is the God who is our deliverer, our redeemer. Yahweh is the one who brought us out of the land of Egypt. He is the one that goes before us in the wilderness. There are no other gods. Commandment number one forbids worshiping any other gods than the Lord himself. Commandment number two forbids worshiping God in the wrong way. It forbids taking anything in creation and putting that before us and saying, that is the Lord God who brought us out of the land of Egypt. The first commandment focuses on God's right to priority in our life over all other things. The second commandment insists that 
God be sovereign, that he be who he is, and that we not try to contain him in some idol. A knockoff God, a substitute God, just won't do. It's kind of puzzling, really, that second commandment. It is one that is mentioned more frequently in the rest of Scripture probably than any of the others. It was the one thing Israel struggled with once they got into the land of Canaan. The issue of idolatry was repeatedly a problem for folk. And yet, it is one that we think very little about. That seems to belong to another time, another place, another culture a long way off. Where are we ever in jeopardy of violating that word? We're in danger of violating that commandment whenever not most of us aren't crude enough to go get a statue from some one of the lawn, you know, places like the one on Hempstead Highway I drive by with every kind of creature carved in concrete you could ever think of. We're not likely to get one of those and set that before ourselves and bow down before. That's so crude. We would never think of that. Our danger is that we do it up here, that we form an image of God in our head, a way of thinking about God, a theology, a way of talking about God that limits God from being God, a way of thinking, acting, worshiping that puts God within the confines of our own ability to understand. We create our own golden calf, a knockoff God who we hope will get us by. And the wilderness is apparently the time we're most vulnerable for those kinds of actions because in the wilderness are the times when we are most demanding that things get straightened out. We want cosmos order formed out of the chaos of those times and we get to demanding not a God who comforts us, but a God who makes us comfortable. And there's a difference between those things. Our knockoff gods limit our conception of God. We put God in a box for a time. It's pretty clear. Human minds are not capable of understanding the fullness of God. I think it was St. Augustine who said a long time ago that uh, it would be like taking, trying to get the, the ocean inside a thimble to take the fullness of God and be able to understand, comprehend God with a human mind. We are more like those blind men facing the elephant and each of us knowing and recognizing only a part but think we've grasped the whole. One blind man thinking the elephant to be like a tree trunk because he had hugged its leg and another to think that the elephant was like a rope because he had grabbed its tail and another thinking it was like a snake because he had grasped the trunk and one thinking it was like a wall because he had felt his side. And often... We are that way. Having grasped, understood some of God's revelation, we can think that we know everything, and it's just not the case. God is far grander, far more mysterious, far bigger than our minds can ever fully grasp. But knockoff gods are not. They are easily understood. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But what was he yesterday? What was he in Israel's experience that was too mysterious for them to handle? Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb or Mount Sinai? When he said to me, Moses says, Assemble the people before me to hear my words so they may learn to revere me as long as they live in the land and may teach them to their children. You came near and stood at the foot of the mountain while it blazed with fire to the very heavens with black clouds and deep darkness. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sound of words, but you saw no form. There was only a voice. He declared to you his covenant, the Ten Commandments, which he commanded you to follow and wrote them on the two stone tablets. What was he yesterday, Moses asked Israel at that point? He was fire, not stone. You ever notice the difference between those two? How attracted we are to sit around a fireplace or a campfire and stare endlessly at that blaze. It's always moving, always changing, always dynamic, never the same, bigger, smaller, different colors, always on the move. You never see anybody doing that with a brick wall, at least not a person in in a good mindset. Because... The brick is just there. It doesn't do anything. God reveals himself to Moses and Israel with no form at all. You saw fire. You saw smoke. You saw things you couldn't understand and control. It wasn't a piece of stone there. 
ever-changing, ever-revealing, never holding still so we can get hold of him. That's our God. The similes and words and language and metaphors that we use to try to speak about God are just that. They are something we hold for a moment, and then we have to let go because another image has to be spoken to be accurate about God, and then another and another and another. And just when we think we've come to understand God, he reveals himself to be bigger than he ever we ever thought him to be. C.S. Lewis once said in his book, A Grief Observed, which is a very powerful little book to read if you haven't ever read that. Lewis kept a journal after the death of his wife, Joy, and he grieved deeply. But one of the things he said in there was that God, he has come to understand as being like the great iconoclast, the destroyer of images, who is constantly shattering the images we make of him. Just when we think we've understood God, he comes along to shatter that image and say, I'm bigger than that. I'm bigger than that. And to take us to another place. Where was he yesterday? He was fire and smoke, not wood or stone. We live with these conceptions of God sometime that have no mystery about them at all. Nothing unexplained. And when that's the way our God is to us, we are serving a knockoff God, a substitute, not the real thing. Knockoff gods, by definition, cannot be any more than we can understand because we've created them ourselves. And it turns out that the wilderness is actually a very fine place for coming to know more about God than we've ever known before. There are some things in the wilderness that God can teach us that we don't learn in other places. We learn about God as our provider in the wilderness. Where will we learn of God as provider except in time of deep need? Where will we learn of God as our guide except in times when we feel lost? Where will we learn of God as bread and water and sustenance, except in those times when we hunger and thirst? Where will we know God as protector, except in those times when things seem to threaten our life? Where will we know God as covenant maker, except in those times when we hear him inviting us to relationship with himself? Israel learned all of those things about God in the wilderness. And they never learned for a moment that he had any resemblance at all to a golden calf. That was a knockoff God. That was the God they wanted they could control. When you find yourself in one of those wilderness places, you're in a great place to know God more fully, to go know God more deeply, to go know God bigger, more personally. But you have to reject the knockoff versions if you're going to know him as he is. We have to say no to the God of comfortable life in place of the God who comforts. Our knockoff gods, besides being confined to a box, are gods that are deeply, deeply related to our culture. I mean, why a golden calf? Why not something else? I'm pretty certain Israel had seen back in Egypt people worshiping statues that looked very much like the one that their priest Aaron had fashioned for them out of the golden earrings. It was a God of the culture. They were only a few months away from having been living in a culture that was steeped in idolatry. They had breathed its air. They had drunk its water. They had been part of that, and it was still part of them. And now in this moment when God is not clearly present, their leader is gone, they're in a confused place, they turn back to something more familiar, something more tangible, something more like what they had known in Egypt. The unnatural thing for them was this rigorous call to trust the invisible God rather than to turn to the visible idols their hands could make. Now, you and I can do this very same thing. We live in a culture where golden calves, but golden arches maybe, that is, we live in a very much in a consumer kind of world. And very quickly, we can breathe the air of our culture. We can have it seep into our pores. We drink its water and eat its food. And we begin to think about God in a way that conforms very much to the way our world talks and thinks about God. The success God, whose blessing is implied by the fact that we're successful. Or the genie in the bottle God, the consumer God, who lets you name it and claim it, who is there like Santa Claus to answer your every whim, and when he doesn't, we get disturbed about him. Or the God who is more like the passive 
grandfather than the loving father who just winks at sin and thinks it's cute and doesn't really worry about our holiness, our life with him. A God like the nations, a God identified with our culture, our government, our way of life, an American Jesus who wraps himself in red, white, and blue and pretty much leads, uh, leads the country. I have seen so many expressions of that. It's a cultural God. It's a knockoff God. The God, the bigoted God, the God who just happens to hate all the same people we hate. Those are the knockoff gods our culture offers. And we will very quickly turn to one of those in the wilderness and let our culture tell us what God is like rather than God telling us what God is like. Those are golden calves. Those are substitutes. They look good to the people that we want to impress with our religion like the Rolex looks on our wrists, but they're not the real thing. Met God, the cultural deity, is nothing like Yahweh, the God of Israel, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. The psalmist said this, Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes, but they do not hear, see. Ears, but they do not hear. Noses, but they do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel. Feet, but do not walk. They make no sound in their throats. Those who make them are like them. So are all who trust in them. O Israel, trust in Yahweh. He is their help and shield. Knockoff gods are the product of our culture and our wishes, but they're not the real thing, and they're of absolutely no help in getting through the wilderness. We need a real God for that. Knockoff gods keep our religion comfortable because they keep God under control. Like Israel with the golden calf, we want a God we can control. Make us a, a God to go before us, they said to Aaron, as if they didn't have one already. But the one they had went before them when he wanted to go before them, when he saw fit to go before them. He was not under their control. Now, the good thing about an idol is it'll just sit right where you left it until you decide it's time to move. Who's in control now? That's one of the things about knockoff gods. We get to control them. We want something just a little more tangible than fire and smoke. That's the essence of various forms of fundamental religion. We want to be able to absolutely understand and control God, to know exactly what God thinks, what God will do, won't do, where we become experts on God in every situation and about every issue. And it's a kind of idol. The essence of idolatry is this attempt to capture and confine and enslave God to our wishes. Roy Honeycutt, who for many years taught the Old Testament at Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, wrote a little book about the Ten Commandments called These Ten Words, and he said this, We fear a word from God, a gospel that is like new wine, fermenting and expanding, discontent and unable to remain in its old forms. We want a word from God that is stabilized so that we can handle it and control it. But when the Word of God ceases to be living, active, fermenting in the heat of its own movement, and at times bursting the old wineskins or tearing new patches off old garments, it will no longer be God's Word, but man's Word we confront. See, the problem with the living God is you can't control Him. The problem with the resurrected Messiah is you can't control Him. He's liable to show up around the next corner. He's liable to do things you didn't predict because He's Lord. And we get uncomfortable with that kind of lack of control in our life. And the wilderness is one of those places where we sense that lack of control maybe more than any other time. Our knockoff gods lose the sense of God's holiness, the sense of God's uniqueness. They steal His holiness from them. The theologians say, put it this way, that an infinite qualitative difference exists between God and us. He's not the man upstairs. He's not just a big man on a chair ruling the universe. There is an infinite difference between God and us human beings. The way the prophet put that is in Isaiah chapter 55 where he says, God speaking, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. As far as heaven is above the earth, so are my ways above your ways and my thoughts above your thoughts. The biblical word for that is holiness. To say God is holy is to say he's not human. He is different from us. 
He loves us with a holy love. He seeks us with a holy passion. He cares about us with a holy concern. But it is not human. He is unique. Romans chapter 1, verse 23, Paul evaluating the idolatry of not just his culture in Roman times, but down through history, talks about what a bad deal it is to turn to a knockoff God. He says, they exchange the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and mammals and creeping things, reptiles. What a poor exchange. The almighty God for a golden calf. Or he says in verse 25, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forevermore. When we lose a sense of God's holiness, God's uniqueness, God's distinctiveness from us and all creation, we have lost the most valuable part of encountering this God. We have reduced God to something we can grasp while the angels cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The entire creation is full of his glory. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul comments on this whole story from Exodus 32 and says all of this was written down as an example for us to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. It's not just an ancient story about Israel. It's for God's people who follow Jesus Christ. How easy it is to let a knockoff God take its place in the temple of our heart rather than the real thing. To make a knockoff God to accept a substitute for the living God is to limit ourselves to the God that we create by our own minds or our own hands, and it keeps us from worship of the God who loves us as himself. It is to become an idolater. We violate the second commandment when we do that, and the God of our own hands comes between us and God himself. How do we avoid that kind of dangerous practice? Because we're all tend that way. Well, here are some things I think that may go into that. One is we have to learn to let God be God. Martin Luther, uh, the leader of the Reformation, had an expression in German, Gott ist Gott. It means let God be God. Um, even in the wilderness, let God be God. Even in mystery, let God be God. Let him be who he is. Do not try to control him. Even in the midst of our suffering, let God be God. Let God be God. Be alert to cultural pressures, the generic God that you hear mentioned in political speeches all of the time, the God of civil religion, the God presented apart from the way he revealed himself as the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That generic God is not the same one who was burning with fire and smoke on Mount Sinai before Israel. He is much more like the calf they had in the valley. Be alert to the cultural pressures to let this God who reveals himself in Jesus Christ be substituted from one our culture would gladly hand to us. Another thing is for you and me to practice obedience, learning to seek obedience rather than comfort, even in the wilderness. That's how God stays God in our life. We determine best we can with his help, we will obey God as God has revealed himself. And worship. Let worship shape you. I, there are not too many times that one sermon or one worship time is the thing that forever changes our lives. But the practice of worship and prayer and singing the hymns and listening to scripture over a period of time begins to erode our stony hearts as living water flows across that stone and begins to shape it into the kind of person, men and women, that God wants us to be. Worship, let it shape you. And look to Jesus Christ. Read the Gospels. Ultimately, we know God by how he has revealed himself in Jesus Christ. Anything that the scriptures say true of Jesus is true of God. And what anyone tells us of God that is not true of Jesus Christ is not true of God. Look to Jesus Christ. He is the revelation of God. Walk with him. Observe him carefully. See his love, his compassion, his power, his own suffering. This is God revealing himself so that we can understand. This is God, it says the word became flesh. God translated himself into a language we speak so we could understand God in Jesus Christ. Jesus is no knockoff cultural met God, but is the way, the truth, the life, the living, resurrected creator and Lord of the universe. I tell you, in the wilderness, we want a God to go before us. We do, and we need one. 
But we want the God of mysterious greatness, not the God of our own hands, not a God that was an earring yesterday. We want the God of comfort, not one that makes us comfortable. We want the sovereign of the universe, not a genie in the bottle that does our will. We want the God of glory and holiness, not a caricature, not an imitation, not an almost real thing. We want God, not a religion that impresses people. In the wilderness, we need the real thing. Let's pray together. Holy Father, we are frightened when we walk in desert places and when we do not know our own way. When we cannot understand your ways, when we cannot always sense your presence, you know our tendency to grasp for something else to secure us rather than to trust you. Forgive us, Lord, for ever attempting to confine you with wood or stone our own limited ideas. Forgive us, Father, for letting a selfish and consuming culture form the ways we think of you. Forgive us, Lord, for our attempts to control you with words and formulas, even our prayers. Forgive us, Lord, for exchanging the wonder of who you are for anything in creation. And we pray that you would let us come to know you in our wilderness more and more clearly in the face of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.